Tree proofs give us a simple way of decomposing compound sentences in a manner that allows us to visually check whether a um, an argument is valid. So how do we do that? Well, we begin, so we take the premises. We join them to the negation of the conclusion. And how do we do that? Well, let's say, for example, we have something like P or Q. And let's say we have T and not P. And our conclusion is Q. What we're going to do is take these, these are our premises. Here's our conclusion. We take the, we list the premises and the negation of the conclusion. as follows, right? Like this. They're all falling in the same path. And then we decompose the complex sentences or the compound sentences. We're going to apply the tree rules to each of the operators that we have in the compound sentences. So for example, the or here, the and, these would be the two, these are the two compound sentences right here. We're going to break them down and we're going, we know we can do this because of disjunctive normal form into a sequence of paths. So we're going to build a tree as follows. We'll check off each of these as we go ahead and decompose following the tree rules, which you can look up in the text. So we've got two paths now when we break P or Q up as follows. Then we've got a, a rule for conjunction which says that okay, both conjuncts fall on the same path. Now since what we're breaking up here has as its descendants two open paths, path one and path two, we list the decomposed version of this the rotten version, I guess that, was, that sounds like, but the, <laughs> the uncompound or the atomic version of this in both paths. Okay, so let's look at what we have here. We've got two, two paths. We'll call this path one over here, and this is path two over here. And we'll examine the paths to see whether they contain a contradiction. If they contain a contradiction, we'll say that the path closes. Okay, so do they? Well, yes, they do. Where's the contradiction in the first path? It's P and not P. Where's the contradiction in the second path? Q and not Q. Both paths close. If the paths close, then we say it's valid. So, very roughly, what we'll do is we'll negate the conclusion. We'll list all the premises and the negation of the conclusion as um, lines on a single path. 
We have one path containing the negation of the conclusion and the premises. Then we'll apply the tree rules to all the logical operators in the compound sentences. We'll resolve the entire set of compound sentences into, a, into paths containing those sentences plus their, their basic constituents. Then we'll check to see where the path, whether the paths close. Close means there's a contradiction, right? If they do close, then the argument is valid. If not, then there's a counterexample. So if we take a very simple case, here we've got the premises and the conclusion of a valid argument. We know it's valid. These are the premises. This is the conclusion. We take the negation of the conclusion. The negation of the conclusion is here. We list it together with the premises here. Then we apply the tree rules to the logical operators, the main logical operators of compound sentences. There's only one compound sentence, so we only have to do that once. We apply the tree rule for OR to this. In all open paths beneath this, we'll put the results. There's only one open path. This one, these, well, there's only two open paths. Well, there's only one open path underneath the P or Q until we go ahead and, and do this. So we'll put P in one and Q in the other. Then we've got two paths once we go ahead and decompose this guy. Now we've got two paths. One says over here says P, not Q, not P, P or Q. The other says Q, not Q, not P, P or Q. Both contain contradictions. P and not P here, Q and not Q here. Now we know that that's a valid argument. It's worth thinking a little bit about um, what an invalid argument might be. Uh, let's take, let's consider an invalid argument. Let's take a sort of standard invalid argument that we know and love. This is denying the antecedent that we know that's a fallacy. So let's go ahead and run the tree rules on that. What do we do? We take, so remember this is our this is our proof over here. Well maybe we'll look at a clean page. So P then Q, not P, not Q. This is the fallacy of denying the antecedent. Let's see what it looks like when we try to run a proof. We'll take the negation of Q, so it's not not Q, the negation of the conclusion. We'll take not P, P then Q. We only have one operator to resolve. It's not P, Q. So now what have we got here? Do we have a contradiction? Well, in fact, we don't have any contradictions, so both paths are open. So what are we saying? We're saying it could be the case that not not P, not P, sorry, not not Q, not P, P then Q, and Q can all be true together. Notice that Q here, and not not Q of course, are the negation of this conclusion over here. Okay, so we're saying that these can be true together. Now, of course, here we're saying that if we, let's say someone insisted on this as a valid pattern of reasoning, then he or she would be saying that it must be the case that not Q follows from if P then Q and not P. We can show that 
they're wrong, we can show by demonstrating a counterexample. The counterexample is that if you deny the conclusion, denying the conclusion is consistent with asserting the premises. So there are other ways things could be. The counterexample is P, then Q, not P, and Q instead of not Q. That's a counterexample. Okay. The other line, the other paths, also generate a counterexample, but now it's getting a little messy to read. Um, so, okay. So we had our case of denying the antecedent, and we showed that there was a counterexample with the um, two open paths. Let's take a look at, you know, how we would demonstrate validity with the truth table. So we said what we do for truth tables is we go ahead and join the premises with a conjunction, with an and, and then connect the premises to the conclusion with a horseshoe, then run the truth table for all of this. So what would that look like? We'd set up our list of conventional truth table orderings, right? So TTFF underneath P, TFTF underneath Q. We'd um, check for each of these operators. We've got TF, TT here. We can ignore that. We've got, we've got to negate this. So FT, sorry, FF, TT. Ignore this, and then F, T, F, T, we can ignore this. So now we'll check for the AND here. What have we got? F, F, T, T. Okay, and then we take, we can ignore these. FFTT, and then we've got a horseshoe. We know that a horseshoe is false in case the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. It's true in all other cases. So here we've got the value for the entire statement. The value is TTFT. So we're saying that the counter example that this is false in case what? In case the third row holds. So what is the third row? The third row, remember our rows, P, Q, P, not Q, not P, Q, not P, not Q. The third is the case where you don't have P and you do have Q. And this is the counterexample. So if someone were to assert this must be true, that this must be true, this complex sentence, we could say no, it's false when the third case holds. It's false in case not P and Q. So let's do this intuitively. Let's go back over here. What have we got? We've got, if I run a marathon, then I'll be tired. I didn't run a marathon, therefore I'm not tired. The counterexample is, I didn't run a marathon, and I am tired. <laughs> okay, so this we know is invalid because of the counterexample. And we know that it's invalid and that there's a counterexample. We know it's not always true. We know it's not always true because there is a case here in the third case. Whoops, that should be a highlighter, not an eraser. Let's fix that. So here in the third case, it turns out this is the case where it's false. The false case is the case where it's not P and it is Q. Okay, so 
if there's a false case for the value as a whole of the sentence, then we know in that false case we've got our counterexample. Now let's return to our tree proof. In the tree proof, we can see that each of these open paths is itself a counterexample. So the open path indicates that it's not always going to be the case that this is true. If it's not always going to be the case, then it's not a valid pattern of inference. And how does it do that? Well, we just read off the open path. If you read off the open path, that gives you the counterexample. So what have we got here for an open path? We've got not not q, not p, if p then q, and q. Okay? So we've got not p here. Let's, so Okay, that was the first one. So let's go back and take a look. Okay, so in the case of the first one, we've got not not p not not q, which is q as we know. We've got not p, p then q, and q. So we say that here we have a counterexample. Similarly over here, it's the same counterexample in fact. Okay, so that counterexample is precisely what the truth table gave us here. All right, so I hope you see some connection between the idea of an open path and the counterexample. I hope that's clear.